Let's talk about how I became a digital nomad. I am a computer programmer and I live on a sailboat. Prior to living on a sailboat, we traveled the world out of backpacks and staying in Airbnbs and hostels. You do not have to be a programmer to be a digital nomad, but it is one of the better, in my opinion, career choices that allows you to be digital nomads. There are many career choices that allow you to be a digital nomad, but there are many that don't allow you to be a digital nomad. So if you're deciding how to become one, it would be better for you to choose a career path that would be more tolerant towards remote work, because that's ultimately what being a digital nomad is, working remotely and traveling while you do it. What are some careers that are more remote friendly? So really any career where you create content online is ideal because typically when you're creating content now this could be copywriting this could be uh, graphic design this could be programming this could be uh, blogging blogging social media uh, you can generally create content asynchronously which means you don't have to be working the normal nine to five that's one of the key components of being a digital nomad is having flexible hours being strictly remote but stuck to a nine to five on the east coast time zone or west coast time zone doesn't really work so well because it doesn't give you the flexibility to travel and explore and you need to be able to to move around you're going to have meetings but you can if you can do your work in the early morning and early evening and then maybe have a few hours during the day where you're responsive online that's great jobs that are not remote friendly tend to be anything where you need like uh, a certificate or or a qualification like nursing healthcare practice and maybe law things state by state if there are government uh restrictions around that career it tends to not be remote friendly also managing positions tend to not be remote friendly now if you work at a company for a long time you may be able to shift into a managing role or a project management managing role but you're gonna have lots of meetings and lots of meetings tend to happen within a certain uh, time window so managing may be remote friendly or may not be but I wouldn't say I'd start looking at managing but if you're working a career you might be able to transition that into a remote friendly managing spot so how to find remote gigs this one is hard not gonna lie uh, but it is doable I started out yeah, as a programmer it's we're pretty much always in demand and if you're anywhere near a city it tends to be fairly easy to get a job programming but as soon as it comes to remote work then things get weird there are a bunch of sites uh, for contract work. Contract work tends to be a little bit more remote friendly, uh, but it also tends to pay a little bit more poorly in my experience. I've talked to some people who seem to command very high contract hourly rates. I've never been able to do that, so uh, I've only ever been able to do mediocre to decent. So on these sites, there's like Elance, Odesk, Guru, uh, there's a whole bunch of them. I don't, I'm not sure what's current nowadays, but on these sites, you should have a little bit of experience, do some projects even if you do them for free, and then don't sell yourself short because there's gonna be people overseas and countries that have lower cost of living expenses and they're always gonna undercut you. So you don't wanna play the, I'm the cheapest person in the market game. What you wanna do is play the, I'm a native English speaker or I'm a native whatever language you speak speaker and I'm pretty decent and I have put out high quality stuff. You can always justify having a slightly higher rate by having high quality. You just then have to deliver on your high quality. I did contract work predominantly at a decent rate programming wise, especially when you're traveling and you don't need as big of a budget. You're not trying to you know, have a mortgage and a car payment and all that stuff. You're just trying to pay for your hostel, Airbnb, plane tickets, and uh, you know, food, really. Uh, if you travel cheap, it's a lot easier. I would recommend for finding a remote gig, a way to start is through contract work and a lot of the content creation stuff like i was saying there's contract work for that you, you might have to have a slightly lower rate until you get some experience and that kind of sucks but uh it, there is a cost to being a digital nomad and you do tend to make less money overall and save less money overall than you would compared to living stationary another really good thing that i think is prudent if you want to be a digital nomad is that you should have a website that shows your portfolio and even if you're just getting started out do some just do some stuff for yourself i mean your website in and of itself can be an example if you're a writer put some of your writing there if you're a graphic artist put some of your graphic art there but have a online presence that you is your basically your name.com and 
put it out there, it's your profile. Uh, for me, I actually got a number of leads from this profile when I was remote or was I, when I wasn't remote and some of them came, some of them were like Facebook and Google and stuff when we lived in California. Uh, so having an online website, I think basically non-optional. You need to have that as if you're wanting to be a digital nomad. You don't necessarily have to write the website yourself. If you're a programmer, you probably should write the website yourself. But if you are not super technical, there are tutorials, there's Squarespace, there's all these sites where you can just drag and drop and create some sort of basic website. You don't have to get too creative. You just need one to prove that you get being digital and remote and how that all works. Uh, like I said, when you're trying to get either a salary or an hourly rate, you tend to have to take a little bit of a pay cut because you're remote until maybe you get some good experience, until you can have that interview and they ask, well, have you done remote work before? And you can be like, yes, I've done remote work here and I've done remote work here and the clients are very happy and I achieved this and blah, 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 blah. Once you can do that, you can maybe start getting less of a quote unquote salary, sa salary penalty for being remote. When you are working remote, you are going to have to interact with your clients or the people that are paying you. So some tips that I have about being able to be in touch. Obviously, if you're in any sort of first world country, it's a lot easier. You can get a hotspot or you can tether against your phone as long as make sure your phone has uh, a data plan associated with it. If you're in a country that's not your native country, just get a prepaid SIM from that country. We did this in the Bahamas and it worked really, really well. Tethering tends to be the way to go. We almost never, ever, ever rely on Wi-Fi anywhere being any good. So we tether 95% of the time and it's worked out well so far. And for sailboats like ours, we put a cell phone booster about 50 feet up the mast and it really helps uh, with the signal and connectivity. We can normally, we can be three miles offshore without the booster and still have some signal, but with the booster up, we've been as far as 10 miles offshore and done like FaceTime stuff. Uh, but the point is, if you're gonna be in an RV or on a boat, which probably is a minority of you, having a cell phone booster is probably a good idea. We are considering satellite internet for us because being on a boat, we go so far offshore that we might need to sell internet, but man, it's so expensive. So I, I would say typically the average digital nomad probably isn't gonna to try to sail across an ocean and keep a full-time job. Uh, so probably don't need, most people won't need satellite internet. And once we do figure out satellite internet, I'll be sure to share all that stuff. But there are some tips and tricks with regard to using your cell phone as a personal hotspot. You want to reduce the amount of tethering that you do for non-important things. So when I do phone calls for work, I don't do the streaming on my computer because the streaming on my computer would be counting against my tethered data and that would just be eating it out. I have about 14 gigs a month on my phone and then the uh, iPad has some too. Uh, and worst case scenario, I can use Jessica's. But there's no point in doing video streaming meetings on my laptop unless I really, really have to for some reason. Like I have to share content or show my screen or something, but that happens rarely. So what I do do is I have a little tripod with a cell phone holder, kind of like a cell phone selfie stick. And whenever I have a meeting, I put my cell phone on the tripod uh, clamped into the cell phone holder and it from the viewer's point of view it looks like a computer screen honestly it looks a little bit better because it doesn't have this angle that a lot of computers have when you're talking to them so um <clears throat> and it doesn't count against any of my data and a lot of you know if you have bluetooth headphones it'll just connect so it's really easy so one of my top tricks is don't take meetings on your computer and then if you have something like an ipad use that for watching Netflix and stuff. Don't tether for that on your computer because that's just gonna waste all your data quickly. Uh, use something like an iPad. It's meant for streaming and it's usually built into the plan. Sometimes it's free, it's part of it, so. A another useful tip is that you probably, if you're doing contract work, try to have one client for a long time. It's better than having many short clients because while you're trying to procure clients and while you're doing interviews, you tend to have to be more connected and therefore a little bit more stationary. That's important. Some other important tips for working remotely as a digital nomad, you should have an online presence texting wise and get those apps on your, whether it's uh, you know, Gchat or even Instant Messenger, like uh, iMessage or WeChat or Slack, which is super popular nowadays. Be present on that a lot. 
it's gonna help make the people you work with feel like you're around. Now you don't always have to be like sitting at a computer, you can have it on your device and set your uh, presence as there, but it's, it's important to have an online presence and you also probably, you need to deliver more frequently. So say you had an assignment due at the end of the week that you needed to create, build, design something. It would be better as a digital nomad to check in multiple times. You're like here's you know prototype A and here's prototype you know B and here, here's the rough draft C and, and instead of just coming in at the end of the week with the final thing, even if they don't care, even if they're like, oh yeah, whatever, that's gonna make you feel more present than you otherwise did and it'll make you harder to fire because you're not just the random person costing money in the corner somewhere. Uh, you also, this should be, this should go without saying, but if you're working remotely, you need to do a better job than normal because you're not as top of mind you don't need to be the person who delivers subpar stuff. So you're gonna have to work a little bit harder and you're gonna make a little bit less money. But at the end of the day, you are the person sitting, you know, working at a cafe in Paris while you watch people go by or you're at a bungalow in Thailand somewhere, right? So that's that's the cost of the life. But so the, one of the perks as a digital nomad is as a digital nomad is you're usually making money and you're from your home country or United States or wherever, but you're traveling somewhere cheaper. This can be tricky, and when you're doing it, when we travel, we travel to be on holiday. We don't travel to a country to work in that country. So we don't declare ourselves as coming to a country to work. Ultimately, we're spending money in that country that we wouldn't be spending money in. So for them, it's a net gain. They're not losing anything by us coming there. And it's not like I'm stealing wages and taking them out of country untaxed or anything like that because the job wasn't from there. Uh, so that's how we do it. Another aspect of traveling remotely, traveling and working is that when you do it, you will probably devote a little bit more time than normal to the same amount of work. So another aspect of being a digital nomad is you kind of need to learn how to just sit down and work a little bit. It seems obvious, but it's not as easy as that. When you're in a new place, you want to explore that new place. So the way that I've found works better for us is to travel slowly. So instead of like only spending a week somewhere if I'm working full time, that's really only gonna give me two, maybe three days worth of experiencing that place. I and mean, that's gonna be a lot between the full time work and the, the exploring. So maybe double or even triple the amount of time you'd have otherwise spent had you not been working. Um, so you're gonna travel more slowly, which ultimately will mean you do spend more money. Uh, so this is where being somewhat budget-minded comes in with regard to traveling. If you're burning a lot of money every single day, uh, you aren't going to be able to travel very long. But the upside is, is when you travel more slowly, you can get weekly and monthly rates at places. So uh, when I was in Italy, I stayed a little bit outside of Rome, not really in the city, but you know, still connected by metro. And I think it was 500 euros for the month. And I had my own room. And it was just with a flat. It was it was an Airbnb, but the monthly rate was way better than the daily or even the weekly rate. So travel slower, give yourself time to do your work right, and also explore. And I mean, I think this is what a lot of you want, digital nomads, either if you're looking to be it or you are it, want. You you want to actually experience the place. You don't want to just go for a week, see the highlights, and then leave. You want to experience the life. So, like I said, when I was in Italy, I joined a gym and worked out. You know, during the week and stuff like that. I wasn't rushing through the experience and only seeing the top tourist hits. So ultimately, I think the biggest takeaway is that you're gonna start slow. You're not gonna make a lot of money, so you might even wanna start working remotely before you travel. That's probably a really good tip, and that is kind of what I did, because working remotely is a learned skill set, and you're gonna start out by not making as much money as you want to. So do that work, and then build up to it. But you're not gonna, what you're not gonna probably be able to do is just stop your nine to five job, go travel and while you're traveling, find an online gig that's gonna let you work remotely that pays well. I did stop my nine to five job and go travel and then find a gig, but it didn't pay well. And so I slowly built it up, but um, I was traveling very cheaply. So there's lots of ways to do it. It's work but it's worth it in my opinion, in our opinion. And the sailboat helps us move slowly. Uh, it just brings its own new challenges with regard to being budget-minded and having connectivity everywhere. But we already did the whole digital nomad thing for 35 countries before 
owning the boat. So uh, owning a boat and being a digital nomad is like a little bit of a harder game. All right, I hope that helps. Uh, it was kind of just a collection of my thoughts on my experience of being a digital nomad for the past six, seven years. And if you have questions, feel free to message us. All right, thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.